Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you had a chance to for a quick break. And uh, uh, we're going to move into now thinking about some of the material that the alumni have uh, prepared for us for this second session for the next hour. And uh, of the 126 projects I mentioned earlier, we've asked uh, seven alums to speak today. Uh, they're representative of uh, not just the 62% who've gone into commercial data science careers, but also of those who have continued on in academic trajectory. When we uh, lined up uh, these invitations, we were keen for them to focus on one of a number of dimensions, um, either their original project that they'd done with the, uh, the original sponsor, their career journey, how they got to where they are now over the last few years, or, or an aspect of their current work that they thought would be of particular interest to this audience. And uh, 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 I think the other advantage of holding this as an online webinar is that we're able to beam people in from around the world. So uh, as well as, I think, uh, a presentation from the Filed Coast, we also have a presentation from Nairobi, uh, amongst other places, over the next hour for you. Um, and just a reminder again, uh, if you have any questions as we go along, please post them in the chat. You may have to uh, log in again to, to do that. Uh, but I can see a couple of comments already uh, in, in the chat. Uh, we have indeed restarted a couple of minutes late, but we'll, we'll try and make up a bit of time. Um, but let me start by, by welcoming our, our first alumna speaker. Uh, uh, Nambu, Nambu Murage is uh, 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 currently working with uh, 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 Grow Intelligence, which is a, an agricultural technology company. Uh, she's based herself at the moment, I think, in Nairobi. It's great to welcome you, Nambu. Uh, you. You're one of the, the portion of people who were actually offered a role from your original internship uh, with, with Tomoko. And you've been with them for a while, but have recently joined Grow. Uh, but I think you're going to be talking a little bit about um, uh, a specific project that you've been involved with while you were at Tomoko. But uh, I'm going to pass the baton over to you and leave you to talk a bit about that work. Welcome. And thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nombusela Murage. As Jonathan said, I was an alumni from the CDRC last year, year 2020. And I'm also a master, an alumni from uh, University of Liverpool master student. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about to, uh, my experience with the CDRC and my project that I've been doing with Tomoko for the last year. I joined the CDRC through um, University of Liverpool. I was doing my master's in geographic data science. And I'd learned about this uh, opportunity through our lecturer uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Danny Ar Aribas Bell and Alex Singleton, and they had told us that this is probably an interesting opportunity that you should look into apply. And one of the specs that was given from Tamoko was very interesting to me uh, to deal with trajectory data, which is uh, part of that had been my interest throughout the master's dissertation. So um the project i'll be presenting to you today is the methodology that we derived uh on getting deriving spatial temporal geographies from mobile gps data and was a data driven approach and we aptly named this project living boundaries and i hope by the end of the dissertation uh, by the end of the presentation you'll be able to uh appreciate why that was so so um i think if you can move to the next slide uh when I first uh, engaged with Tamoko, they had a very broad spec question on what they want to do with their data and were very um, hands off in terms of the, the discussion point that they want me to explore. And one of the interesting questions that was posed to me was how we can model and quantify collective experiences of uh, city dwellers and after that uh, determine region, regions of shared common experience. So it was a very abstract question and it was um, sort of like a blank sl slate for me to develop my own techniques and explore new areas that they, they as a company have not been um, interested to explore or possibly not had the opportunity as Jonathan and Keith mentioned that these are sort of the long haul projects, the ones that you'd like to do, but it's more of an experimentation kind of process. So that was the question, how do you quantify experiences? collective experiences. So this was the methodology that we came up with. Next slide. I had a data set of 1.2 billion and 
it came as a shock from a student who uh, most of the case study uh, subjects that we've been working on or the case study data sets that we've been working on have been clean data sets with at most maybe 100,000, 200,000 uh, data points. And immediately we started my project, uh, Tomoko gave me about 1.2 billion uh, data points of GPS uh, traces that were generated about, by about 6.7 unique users in New York City. And this was the data set from which we were supposed to um, try and explore how we can map out shared common experiences. So the key focus of my methodology or the approach that I took to this uh, uh, to this project was on data managing and data pre-processing. It's, uh, as we all are aware, that it's a focal point in terms of the accuracy of your analysis, that you make sure the data set that you have is clean and correct, and it, it can be able to give some sort of level of confidence to the kind of outputs that you get. So I can break this down into two main parts. Um, the first three, the first three steps relate to pre-processing and data managing, which is on removing um, erroneous data. Then we did a, I developed a very unique um, uh, algorithm compression that the the company and the university were very excited to explore. And then we went into classifying the data, and finally I'll be able to talk about. Uh, the intersection of GIS and network graph theory, which has also impacted my work currently that I'm doing in, in grow intelligence. And then finally, I'll be able to show you some of the projects, some of the boundaries that came out of this. Next slide. So one thing that I want us to have a bit in our background when we're working with GPS data is the idea of low dimensional rep representation. And that was the main goal of the data pre-processing steps that we have this vast amount of data set. We have about 1.2 billion, and you want to run Python scripting on that, and it becomes a nightmare, almost impossible. You want to, you'd want to first clean the data set. You want to reduce it to a, man, a manageable state. So this is the goal of low dimensional uh, representation. We, this goal of low dimensional representation was the key. Uh, output of the unique algorithm H3 trajectory compression algorithm that I developed. And in the next slide, we want to, we were taking advantage of um, grading libraries that are out there to be able to consider, uh, to be able to one, to, 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 to actually play two roles uh, in a sense. Um, one cater to the low dimensional representation when we're looking at uh, data pre-processing and then two for geo privacy. As we all know, like data privacy and data ethics is something that's very focused and uh, that's coming to focus and is very central in terms of how we're going moving into data science. And one of the things that we wanted to inbuilt in our methodology was how do we um, sort of introduce a level of obscurity that allows us to reduce the data set as it is and at the same time cater towards um, obstru obstructing um, locational privacy of the the data points that were collected during this uh, du during uh, for this data set and the in individual data uh, data points that we have to take into account their privacy concerns so for this particular project, we use Uber H3 just because of the infrastructure that's currently running in, in the company we, where they're using GCP and BigQuery to um, process their data set. So it was a very seamless um, library to use as well as um, the flexibility and reproduc reproducibility of this grading method. Next slide. So we moved from translating our data points to H3 grid cells, and then finally um, getting that, that user single trajectory to be able to detect stops. And the reason why this was so was because um, when you're talking about experiences, you, how, you have to think about how much time someone is spending in a meaningful place. Yeah. So some of the points and the the, the 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 points that we had that were reduced to now the Uber H3 cells, we did a time threshold on those particular uh, data points to be able to single out the stops within that user's trajectory. And the idea is these stops represent, um, in in a sense, the proxy of 
someone's experience in that particular area that the, if they if if for example that cell if someone stayed in a cell for more than 20 minutes then there's something meaningful they're doing in that cell as opposed to just moving through a particular region so that was the ideology behind the reason why we filtered out for stops only and if you move to the next slide our outcome for the H3 compression, uh, is, there's an example here, is like if you look at the data set that I've, I've shown you right now, some of the data points that have been attributed to a particular H3 cell were continuously within a certain same region um, of, that, of that particular uh, cell. So you, you can see in, in like the first nine rows that this user had a meaningful stop at that area between uh, I think that's seven or six to around to around eight a.m. the morning, and all those data points had been summarized to one data point to be able to take the the highest and lowest maximum and uh, minimum time thresholds of entering and exiting that cell, and that was the whole point on how we were able to translate and maintain the special integrity, is, is, is the special structure of the of the trajectory path of that user and maintain it, but still reduce the data set to a very interesting um, and manageable uh, representation of the same data. So if you go to the next slide, these were the results. We, we were able to summarize about um, 300, 390 million data points uh, to about uh, 31 million data points for, uh, for uh, well, almost close to half a billion for 27 for 11 357 million data points to about 31 million for october 25 million for november and 23 million for december so we achieved very useful um compression uh, and 90 92.7 compression rate across all three months and the interesting thing about this was that um we were able to we, we were able to reproduce this 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 um this algorithm on another data set, on several other data sets within the organization taking advantage of uber h3 which allows for reproduci reproducibility of those grid cells so uh, the h3 trajectory compression was uh, uh, developed both in python and in in sql for the for this particular use case because i was dealing with such a vast size of a data set I, I implemented it, I was using the SQL implementation, but with parallel computing uh, on like Spark nodes, you can be able to achieve the same in Python. Next slide. So then we go to the meat of the, of the, process, uh, of the, of, of the project, which, which was on the combination of network graph theory and GIS. And one of the things that was very exciting for me was to be able to, um, it was be able was to be able to understand and map out user to pl user to place experiences and translate that to numerical figures that can be able to be quantified as an edge in a network graph. So uh, another concept that I would like to highlight in terms of um, the the project was the idea of incorporating the idea of special uh, special interdependency, which is the idea that. Um, two places are connected to each other based on the commonality of sets of vis visitors over a period of time. So taking that understanding of these relationships between um, venues or places based on how people, a common set of people are uh, visiting these places as well is the core fundamental of this, of this project that was trying to translate a very abstract question of mapping out common user experiences and actually translating that into a network graph of who, in which their edges, the edges between a user and a place is signaled by the distance uh, of that location as well as the temporal signatures. So one of the things that um, we came up with or uh, from just from, ex I, th I think a, the good example that I can, I can give was that this idea of user to place relation uh, speaks to the idea of sp semantic proximity. So we all know that Tobler's law is on nearer things are closer, similar things are closer together than things that are far away. 
And that idea that um, past researchers have implemented uh, distance decay functions on a network graph. So the contribution to the, for, towards these projects was introducing uh, temporal signatures as proxies for user experience, therefore bringing up the idea of semantic proximity. So in this particular use case, I incorporated um, average duration visits as a, and summarized that to as a as a as a factor, a weight factor on the edge list that was uh, that was enabled us to come up with our uh, with our with our communities. So in the next slide, oh, so this is the visual representation of that in, those individual user to place interactions and summarizing those individual user to place interactions into a. In, into uh, using network uh, uh, community detection in network graphs into one geography that you can be able to say that there is a common set of people that visit this place and this their shared experience. So in the next slide, we this was the output. We got a cluster of several nodes on our network graph and. At the moment, it wasn't meaningful because it just looks like a cluster of nodes. But the good, th the interesting thing about this is that every node here actually has a real world representation H3 grid cell. So when you look to the next slide, we were able to take this, this interesting node collision and map it out to the actual real world um, cells. So in the demo, uh, if you go to monthly profiles, Sorry, um, please just go to the monthly profiles. Yep, October, November. This is the output. We have self-organizing maps and a methodology that allows us to develop um, geographies that are based on user experience that have no real delineation on pre-prescribed boundaries. So when you, if you zoom in, you can be able to see what, what as, in, as, as highlighted by various other researchers that there's a regularity, spatial and temporal, temporal character, there's a regularity to the spatial and temporal characteristics of human movement. So when you explore the profile of October to the profile of December, understanding that there were different sets of users who contributed to this data, who matched up to almost regular um, boundaries and geographies. So if you can be able to see like in Manhattan, that um, long strip there, the regularity of the profiles from October to December, October to November, seeing that we had about like five geographies naturally, naturally uh, delineating themselves across different sets of users. And one thing that's also interesting about this um, self-organizing uh, ideology of, map of mapping is that the people and how they experience their city tell you how the, the natural boundaries form. And, and we, I think that we had theorized and we're exploring further is that smaller geographies actually give you an intuition to the distribution of, of, of amenities. As you can see in Manhattan, the distribution of amenities is very close knit and the geographies are smaller. That basically means that anyone who happens to fall in like the pink cell there. Um, these are the extents to which we theorize they'll move around that area of Manhattan because previous people on previous experiences moved around the city in this uh, in such a manner. Another thing that was very interesting was the high stability of some geographies. Uh, at the very bottom uh, left of, uh, of the um, of, of New York is um, the area near jo J JF Kennedy Airport and that geography across all six, all three months had been very stable and even the with the boundaries delineating, delineating themselves accurately to show that um, that area is very stable, the distribution of amenities is very precise and if someone happens to be in that area, these are the uh, extents of boundaries we, we think that they may be able to um, uh, explore and move through. So we had several um, profiles. I did profiles for October, November, December, and also did profiles for weekend to weekday. Um, yeah, there was several profiles for weekend to weekday, and as well as day profiles for how people move in the afternoon to evening, 
And one of the interesting things that we were able to see and that is backed by literature is that Bronx, Bronx uh, is a very, the, the geography is developed a very large and it actually aligns up with some of the use cases studies that have been mapped out in urban planning in New York City, that the, the area has uh, its distribution of amenities is not that precise. So people have to move through a wide space to get to whatever they need. So um, this was the project, um, it's still ongoing. Uh, we, we, we had a collaboration with Tamoko after my dissertation to try and um, work towards um, publishing this methodology or some part of it. Um, it was a very interesting experience. It was very uh, fulfilling and it allowed me to get into a very interesting space on and GIS and network graph theory. And that's some of the work that I'm doing in my current um, in my current company where I'm looking into geospatial semantics and uh, GIS workflows. So it's the, com it's the interesting intersection of network graph theory and natural language processing and trying to see how we can be able to use ontologies and semantic layers to introduce a very interesting uh, question answering workflows for GIS. Yep, that's it for me. Um, excited to have any questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Nambu. That's a, a really fascinating uh, worked example of the kind of long haul project that uh, Martin and Keith, and, and Keith were talking about earlier on. You know, mm. In this case, about how you quantify collective experiences. Uh, and what fascinates me is that you know, this has both kind of academic and commercial, but also policy impact uh, potentially as well. So uh, I, I had a couple of quick questions. Um, I, I'm conscious that we're, we're, we're close to time on this, but I, I, I couldn't resist asking. Uh, one, one is, you, know, you, you mentioned that your shock at discovering there were 1.2 billion data points uh, that you had to kind of come to terms with uh, for unique users in, in New York City. I was just yeah. curious how, how well your university experience had kind of prepared you for working at that scale, you know, making sense yeah. of large and complex community data. Um, yeah, um, so this is one thing that I actually mentioned to um, uh, Dr. Danny. The data sets we've been working with in the university are at most 200, 500,000 uh, rows, and they're usually very clean, and we appreciate that sort of the experimentation factor to it. Um, but I must admit, uh, the company really took time in um, helping me. Uh, so sort of orient myself in in terms of industry because industry will not work at um, experimental levels. They'll be working at actually the first data set I got was two point nine, <laughs> just so you know. And then I was like, let's reduce it to one point two. <laughs> we'll we'll see how we can work with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, someone's just commented on the chat. It's lovely to see multiple spatial methods with use cases. You know, it's it's a, it's a great worked example, as I say. Um, I mean, I was also interested in the kind of it, the, the, the what you thought the impact that your, your work had had on the kind of attitude and behavior of the business to new data science projects. Do you think it opened their eyes to some extent to what, what was possible? Yeah, it did. And actually, if I can answer your question in two parts, mm -hmm. um, the company was very impressed with the kind of work we were able to achieve. And like I mentioned, the H3 trajectory, in, uh, tra the H3 trajectory algorithm is actually in use with, inside the company. And I was very excited to know that my work um, that I thought was just a dissertation work is actually being used in the industry. But more so, even also the impact and feedback that I gave to the university in terms of how do we incorporate more real life work experiences in um, the university setup in, in learning because it really dives you into the deep end really quick. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it puts you in the deep end yeah. real quick, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's a question finally on the chat from Samantha is, uh, have you tried Alteryx? Great software to support big data if you want to go bigger, bigger than 1.2 billion, that is. They also support spatial data. Oh, I will I will definitely check it out. Fantastic. <laughs> well, this is the benefit of a of a network community here offering offering suggestions on, on future work. So Nombu, yeah. thank you so much for, for that. Really a fascinating case study. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, and I hope you can carry on joining us for the rest of the of the uh, the event. Um, we're going to move to our second alum speaker. Uh, and in this case, we're I'm delighted to welcome Alec Davis, uh, who is a data scientist at Pets at Home, colleague of Martin, who we heard from earlier on today. Uh, and um, 
Alec is going to talk us a bit uh, through actually his original project, uh, his uh, background as a, as, a, as a PhD student in geographic data science at Liverpool, and how all those pieces connect to where he's ended up in, uh, at present in terms of his work at Pets at Home. So, uh, Alec, welcome, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks for the invite today. Um, I'm not sure if I can match the introduction uh, Martin's already given to me, but uh, I'll give it a go. So yeah, I'm a data scientist at Pets at Home. Uh, to give a bit of background, uh, I was in the first cohort of uh, geographic data science uh, master's students um, at Liverpool University, um, and then went on to do a PhD uh, in geographic data science. Um, I was funded through ESRC, um, but my PhD was part of um, the CDRC as well. So I had a lot of interaction with the CDRC. Um, and I was based in a geographic uh, data science lab. So a few people that have already been mentioned, like uh, Danny Rebus Bell and Art Singleton. Um, Alex was my secondary supervisor on the PhD. Um, and Mark Green was my first supervisor. Um, just a, a background of my PhD, it was mainly around um, using new forms of data and data science um, to explore health in new ways. Um, but I also ha have interests in terms of research in, in, in the retail environment as well. So yeah, um, so moving on. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the project I did. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the impact it kind of had uh, on my journey at the, at the stage of a, as a master's student at the time. Uh, I'm going to talk over the benefit um, and then go on to the progression and just briefly mention the future as well. Um, so yeah, um, talking about to start the project. Um, so the project uh, title was How Does Competitive Presence Influence uh, the Performance of Click and Collect Sites? Uh, it was a 2016 um, master's dissertation uh, and the partner was Sainsbury's. Um, to give a bit of background, um, online grocery um, really started to take off um, towards the end of the, the 2000s, towards 2010. Uh, there was heavy investment from uh, sort of the big players in in the in the supermarket um, industry, um, and the, the the main original um, investment w tended to be in in, in home delivery. Uh, there was a lot of research, particularly in France, um, around something that's called the last mile costs, because um, there's quite a heavy additional cost of delivering um, from store to uh, customers' homes, um, so there was a need to sort of reduce that cost, make it more efficient, um, and also um, remove remove the potential for failed deliveries, which were quite high cost. So, so these are sort of the benefits from from a from a, a retailer of launching Click and Collect, um, but also Click and Collect. Um, although home uh, home delivery and online meant uh, the, the, the customer didn't have to go into a store and have the inconvenience of things like queuing or searching for stuff. Um, th there was an additional new inconvenience of having to wait around for a delivery. So what Click and Collect allowed was for someone, uh, it was typically if they were on a commute or, or, or something similar, they would be able to just um, stop at a dedicated um, site, typically in the car park, Immediately load the shop in into the back of the car and then and then drive off. Uh, it didn't. It wasn't necessarily um, focused on on cars. Uh, you, you, there, there were there were examples of click and collect sites um, at sort of train stations across across the the market, um, but it primarily focused on on on, uh, on uh, cars. Um, so in order to to sort of look at um, click and collect. Um, there was a need need for some form of catchment. So Sainsbury's, it was at the time it was a new a new offering to Sainsbury's. Um, they they put quite heavy investment in it um, and opened a number of sites, but they wanted to know uh, things that impacted the performance, uh, particularly on competitive presence. In order to analyze this, uh, catchments needed to, to be created, and, and typically. The, the most basic level of catchment would be a, a linear a linear catchment where you just draw a, a buffer around a point, uh, which would be the, the store's location. And it could be uh, 5, 10, 
15 kilometers anything that's determined by um some form of of, of research it could be typical drive time um but the problem with the linear buffers is it doesn't account for things like uh pedestrianized areas um one-way systems uh bodies of water that mean that that it's not a case of that is your catchment the catchments vary considerably with with the road network and things like attractiveness so uh the project um the first step was to be uh, build a bespoke um, set of catchments uh the, the method ended up being a, a huff huff model which is a type of uh, spatial interaction model, um, specifically a gravity model, where you have an attractiveness feature, which is typically a, the size, but it can be a composite index of other um, pull factors. Um, and, the, and it also includes uh, the road network as well. So it's a, it's a delineated catchment and it's more accurate to, to uh, um, an actual catchment in real life. Um, so once we had that, um, we're able to, to explore, explore um, first of all, spatially, uh, rural urban differences, uh, to see if anything unexpected happened in certain areas. Uh, you typically expect urban catchments to be smaller, um, so and rural catchments to be larger. But this 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 allowed for uh, an examination of, of that once the model had been tuned. Um, and then extending beyond that, we could we could then answer the question of how does competitive presence influence the performance. Um, and we looked at three sets of characteristics, so competition, store characteristics, and geo geodemographic uh, or socioeconomic factors. Um, we looked at them in isolation uh, on, a, on a proxy for uh, performance, which was demand, and then we combined them all into, into, a, into a model as, as well uh, in order to look at the effect once uh, all the features were included uh, together. So, uh, in terms of the impact this had on my, on my journey, um, it, it was a lot of at first, so uh, it's, it's kind of previously been discussed so far, but um, it was my first opportunity to, to apply what I'd learned in, in sort of uh, modules in, in the class. Um, so, at, at Liverpool, during my undergrad, uh, Alex Singleton taught um, a, mo a module that included um, spatial interaction models. And then in the masters, uh, part of the masters uh, at the time, and when I was teaching during my PhD, uh, Les Deligia, um he uh, taught uh, spatial interaction, uh, retail catchments, uh, and, and that kind of thing. So I had a, a good understanding and knowledge, and I was able to actually apply it. And then the, the second point is, is highly linked. So it's the first opportunity to, to use um, real data um, on something that isn't just for a market. You, you know it, it matters. It's not just a piece of coursework. It's, there's, a, there's an industry or a partner who, who has a vested interest. So it's, it's that first real uh, project um, to get stuck into. Um, Beyond this, uh, it was my first research paper, first conference presentation, uh, and, and this really helped um, my development uh, during my PhD, uh, knowing what to expect um, once uh, research is done. Uh, and then finally, I've got a point in there purely because of my background in geography. Um, it, it's an opportunity to, to focus on something that's truly geographic um, without the geographic aspect, aspect of catchments. Yeah, the, the, the analysis doesn't really work. So a lot of data science, you might just have a geographic feature, um, but this is this is uh, highly focused on the geography and then the statistics comes after. Um, so, so it's a really good one uh, for me as a, as a, as a geographer, um, or as a background in geography anyway. Um, so I've got quite a few uh, benefits on here. These are sort of five areas that I've perceived are the, the most beneficial as, as for me uh, when I was a master's student, but there's there's also some um, inclusion here of, of benefit for, for the research body and also um, the partner. So something that's probably overlooked a bit is, is, is the first step is you have to apply and you have to, uh, in my case, and I think a lot of cases, you have to have a, an interview and it's quite technical. Um, that's not to, that's a comparison to, um, anything you've done before and 
and as Jonathan's sort of showed, that there is a, a lot of uh, transition from the masters into industry, uh, and you really need to have some experience to be able to do well. So this is the first experience that anyone will probably get of something that's technical uh, and, and proving you you know the technique and you can explain how you've used methods. Uh, I think that's a really important skill that the, the, that's probably overlooked that the, the scheme offers. Um, beyond that, there's the technical approach. So like I've already mentioned, you're applying the techniques you've learned on real world scenarios. Uh, and you have to become the expert, which is something that you do um, throughout the PhD. And I've found in my experience in industry so far, um, you've spent a lot of time learning the skills. So it's now your time to say, this is a method that should be used. This is a method that shouldn't be used. For example, why Huff would be used over other, other models. Um, so that's, a, that's an important skill, uh, particularly in academia when you're defending your paper to reviewers. Um, but also in industry when you're trying to prove that you, your method that you're suggesting is, is the one that should be used. Um, and then there's a benefit to the to the partner that you get master's level students to focus on a problem. They have a vested interest in doing well because it's fundamentally going to be a score or, or a mark towards their, their overall grading of the master's. Um, beyond this as well, you've, you've obviously got um, supervision. In my case, uh, Danny Rebus Bell, um, but also uh, Les Deligia as, as well. Um, so really good uh, level of experience from both of them. Um, so it's beyond just a, a master's student because you've, there's obviously support there from um, the lecturers, uh, researchers. Um, and then it's already been mentioned quite a lot, so I'm not gonna go over it too much, but there's a facilitation of new technologies and new data sets. In particular with this one, there's data sets such as uh, Geolytics Retail Points, which is an open data set. Um, and, and that was a new techno new um, data set for me uh, and getting used to the caveats in the data, cleaning the data, getting it uh, filtered down to what you need. Um, so it's, it's, it's something beyond the classroom, which is a, a really important um, skill that, that, that is, is sort of driven from this. Uh, there's a project handover. Um, so a lot of the time I, I did it myself and I saw it a lot with teaching. Um, code will be written or, or uh, GIS will be sort of done in a way and you'll know you have, you'll have quick fixes or version one, version two, final version, all that kind of stuff. But with this, uh, you're forced into sort of using a proper data science style of, of, uh, of working. Um, and then there's a repository handover um, of code and documentation. So it has to work. You can't just go at this point, you have to do this random uh, bug fix or, or whatever, you, you're producing something that can be repeated. Uh, and that's a really important skill down the line. Um, obviously there's documentation, uh, documentation that comes with that and then it extends to research output. So uh, I did a, the, the Doug poster that was a part of the scheme and then uh, presented uh, at Jizruk in 2017, I think it was, and then published uh, the paper. So beyond the documentation, uh, the, the company can can see a lot more detail, but also the research area benefits because there's a case study with real data there as well. Um, and finally, there's, there's a networking of just getting people in the same room. Um, people, are, uh, as part of the project, I went to Sainsbury's quite a lot, but I invited um, Matt, uh, who was at Sainsbury's, who was the partner contact at the time up to, to Liverpool. Uh, and it's getting people like Matt in the room with with people like Les Deligia, who is uh, got got a wealth of research in, in the area. So it's facilitating that. Um, this is probably my last detail slide. Um, so, uh, the, in terms of what happens, what's happened since uh, the the project, um, the the project that was turned into a paper and it's published in the International Journal of Retail and Distribution Management. So if you if you want to read any more information uh, beyond what's on the CDRC project uh, archive, there's a lot more detail there. Uh, in terms of click and collect, um, there's a new sort of uh, factor in, involved in click and collect now where it's beyond just convenience and it's turned into um, safety as well um, because of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so 
this is sort of uh, meant that a lot of uh, a lot of retailers now have to offer this as, as a standard offering to still uh, well with restrictions to be able to still uh, operate from retail parks um, and reduce the strain on on uh, distribution so uh, it, essentially it, it's kind of taken off uh, massively recently um, beyond what it so the, the growth that already happened uh, and then personally it's, it's the domain level expertise um, and that allowed me to, to uh, when teaching and demonstrating on, on as part of my PhD or on undergrad and master's modules uh, I had real understanding of how the what I was teaching uh, can be applied um, I went on to use further C, uh, uh, well I use CDRC data sets uh, in, my, in my thesis um, so beyond just the CDLC uh, master's scheme uh, 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 and using further uh, consumer data through CDRC. Uh, and then it, the, the understanding of the data science project and how that works as well um, was just uh, really important for both academia and and in industry. Um, so just finally, uh, hopefully there's many more um, great master's uh, dissertations. I look through the projects uh, list for this year, and there's some some great ones on there. Uh, so it's quite, it's really exciting. Uh, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, CDRC. Um, it's been it's been a, a great experience for my masters, and then uh, beyond that, uh, my PhD, uh, CDRC data sets uh, and the network provided has, has given me uh, a wealth of uh, experience uh, and enabled me to really build um, some. A strong CV and and some really good research and experience. So yeah, I just want to say thanks to everyone involved. That's great. Thank you so much, Alec. And it's a really, that's a really nice journey presentation. Uh, you know, taking you from that original master's work through and the academic experience and the commercial experience. Um, just just a reminder for those of you looking at the chat, uh, you might just need to um, uh, refresh uh, your uh, web page uh, and put your name back in again if you if you if it has gone offline. But again, please do ask any questions as we go along on, on the chat. I had a couple of points I wanted to raise, Alec, with with, with your uh, presentation. You're, you're different from many of the other uh, colleagues we have presenting today in that, in that you, you're also a PhD student. And I was curious that, you know, although you'd had the, the previous experience as a master's student with the, uh, the scheme, do you think that uh, working on the PhD affected the way in which you were able to work with business? Um. I think the difference with the PhD is there's not necessarily the, the contact, uh, direct contact with um, the company, um, but definitely uh, some of the secure data sets that I used um, are in um, SQL databases, and it's not something that's typically taught um, in, in geography, um, but it's a key skill in industry. Everything's in a SQL or SQL type uh, database, so that that experience was was really important. Yeah, because I what am I thinking about some PhD students here in Oxford? That one of the challenges sometimes is that they 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 kind of revert from a more practical engagement with the company at, in the masters and become very academic in the PhD and, and perhaps lose some of that applied perspective potentially in in, in what they're doing. Um, I mean, the, the fact you're working on Click and Collect, I think, is also very interesting. And as you say in that final slide, it's coming to its own during the pandemic. But I was just curious, what, what what's your sense of how the insights you were able to bring to bear? For Sainsbury's have actually helped the business over the past year in in understanding you know click and collect. Um, so at the time when uh, it was done, uh, sort of twenty sixteen, mm. uh, the 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 goal of of the project was also to be able to build something that could be usable in the next five years. Yeah. Um, so I suppose that kind of ends sort of now. But that was very much the the um, I, idea from uh, Matt, who was the the, the contact at Sainsbury's. Um, yeah, I, I don't know in terms of how that's affected it uh, and what's what's gone on because I, I haven't got any view of that. But uh, the, the the vision was definitely there for it to be used yeah, yeah. long term. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking the sort of yeah, the, the sort of the value it added in terms of early insights into this you know, this developing kind of area of distribution. But Alec, thank you so much indeed for that. Um, and uh, uh, as I say, we we might have a few questions on the chat as well a few bit later on. But uh, but thank you for your contribution. Brilliant. Um, we're going to move on now to our final uh, presentation of this session. And uh, this is, uh, if you remember my slides earlier on this morning, uh, showing you the, um, the companies that have been most engaged 
in the, the CDRC MDS scheme over the years. The movement strategies featured in those top three. And so it's quite fitting that we have a couple of contributions from uh, colleagues who are working within movement strategies who were part of the scheme. And uh, Christian Tong, who's now a senior consultant uh, within movement strategies, has actually, of course, come full circle because he's now in a position where he's uh, co-organizing the involvement of the firm with uh, the MDS scheme. So this is an ideal kind of closing of the loop, if you like, with sort of word of mouth effects and so on. Uh, and he's joined in this presentation by Chris Belmont, who is a graduate analyst at Movement uh, and who was involved in the scheme in, in 2019. Uh, as you'll see from the bio, um, Christopher trained as a sociologist, but saw the error of his ways and uh, became a data scientist instead. Um, but uh, they're going to do a joint, uh, I think, presentation uh, for us uh, to, to, to conclude our, our second block of sessions. So over to you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. I guess, uh, and thanks to everyone as a kind of prelude to our talk, thanks to everyone at the CDRC uh, and University of Liverpool, from my perspective, for, for everything that's been done uh, for me over the last few years. I guess my focus today is going to be on uh, how much the CDRC has helped me. But actually, um, now I'm sort of four or five years at Movement Strategies, um, how much the CDRC has helped Movement Strategies as well. Um, we are a commercial uh, body, but really do have a, a focus on research. Uh, and the research done by the CDRC really is important to us uh, as a company. Um, so just a quick uh, introduction for, for anyone on on the conference today who isn't aware of Movement Strategies. Um, we are uh, founded in 2005. We're about 35 people, although growing quickly since we've just been uh, merged with GHD, who are a sort of 10,000 person strong professional services company. Um, um, we're the sort of world leader in people movement and crowd dynamics. Um, and we have a real specialism in what we call movement analytics, uh, one of our sectors. And the focus there is really, uh, you know, any type of interesting data that can understand people movement. So whether that be GPS, uh, spend, Wi-Fi, uh, computer vision um, or, or, or AIS and, and any other alternative new data sources that we can find. And what I found about movement strategies is that um, as a geographer and, and geographic data science student uh, who came through Liverpool, um, it's really interesting to work with people from all different backgrounds, whether that be data scientists and, and people who actually probably put me to shame these days, like Cristobal, who I'm joined with today, or criminologists and, and urban planners, a real wealth of uh, insight and different perspectives. So as I say, we were, we were merged in, or sorry, formed in 2005, and our traditional business is around crowd, crowd dynamics consultancy. Um, so helping to design, deliver, and operate uh, some of the biggest or, or most complex uh, venues and spaces uh, in the world, whether that be uh, 100,000 people in a stadium, whether that be uh, you know specific religious sites like the Holy Mosque in Mecca, where we see uh, incredibly complex movements, or, or more recently, um, it, in light of the being a lack of crowds, um, designing social distances uh, solutions for venues. So trying to maximize the capacity of spaces, um, you know, whether that be offices or, or return to commercial spaces or, or, or stadiums and, and major events uh, and such like. Um, and so, as you can imagine, we use hell of a lot of data uh, in our in our world. And on the back of that, we sort of joined or merged, uh, created our our, our sub-business, Movement Analytics, which, as I say, focuses on uh, all types of interesting data, whether that be cellular data with our partners O2, um, Telefonica, um, and, or Wi-Fi, we're, we're sort of Cisco, uh, uh, official Cisco partners, so whether that's uh, smart Wi-Fi or, or smart cameras via Cisco Meraki, and then alternative new data sources. But the use cases there really range from anything from, uh, you know, whole, whole uh, country transport networks, understanding um, where people board, say, the West Coast mainline and, and where they are light and where their home and work locations are. Um, retail use cases, so uh, where are people spending money? Um, how are they spending money? Uh, what are they spending it on? Um, we, we partner with Visa. Um, so we, uh, I think the last estimate I heard is that Visa is 95% of the UK's uh, plastic spend, so, so card spend. Um, so having uh, their data is incredibly powerful for understanding what people spend and where. And also at the citywide scale as well. So uh, if you're a business improvement district, we've got a hell of a lot of data that, that probably tells you how people move through that space um, and also uh, you know, how they got there, what they do when they're there and, and sort of their behaviors throughout their uh, customer or, or visitor journey. 
And so with in, in light of this um, combination of data sources, we, we combined this uh, and blended it into a dashboard uh, output so that cities or, or retail or property owners can now access these and understand the whole consumer or visitor journey. So whether that be um, on a very quiet day, what's happening in, say, the center of Liverpool, or whether that be a really busy event day where we've got, say, um, you know, 90,000 people at a stadium, uh, how does that affect the, the sort of spend? Does that mean that residents aren't spending money within the city or, or even visiting the city that they that they live in? A really useful tool for uh, planning uh, and, and sort of uh, economic understanding. So, you know, at the moment, incredibly powerful for understanding uh, sort of uh, economic uh, uh, sort of re revamping or trying to get our high streets uh, back alive after the, the tough few years that we've just faced uh, during the pandemic. Um, and so just quickly going over this, uh, sports and events, transport, cultural, healthcare, education, as I said, effectively anywhere where there's large amounts of people or um, uh, crowded spaces. Um, and really just, uh, uh, again, uh, just flying through this in the interest of time, but um, working with some incredibly high, high profile clients. And I think the reason that I'm touching on that today um, it's because as someone with four years experience, I think the, the kind of exposure to clients uh, from movement strategies sort of via the CDRC scheme um, has been, you know, absolutely great. Um, you sort of look at the people who are in my contact list uh, from four years and, and it really is, uh, you know, not to be uh, uh, sniffed at. It really is a huge list of very uh, high profile venues and, and clients that we've worked with, which is, um, you know, all you could ask for as a as a graduate or, or sort of someone quite young in their career, um, and, and a, you know that all stems from the CDRC giving me the opportunity to to sort of uh, open the door at Movement Strategies. And um, so the CDRC um, at Movement Strategies, we've participated since 2015, and and someone in the audience might be able to correct me, but I believe we've won prizes in five out of six years, whether that be first or, or runner up prizes or or prizes in the poster competitions. Um, at, the, at current, three former students are now full-time employees and colleagues at Movement Strategies. So, um, you know, not just for uh, uh, for the research benefits, but actually for, for finding uh, really, you know, talented colleagues. It, it, it's really important to us as a kind of entry to it, sort of handpick, uh, you know, good good minds from the universities. Um, and, and that's kind of reflected in the way that we approach the scheme. You know, we're really keen on training and mentoring and proofreading um, we're sort of lucky that in-house we've got adjunct professors uh, and kind of people who are uh, research based as well. Um, and, and again, ongoing support from uh, 10,000 people globally now that we're part of GHD. Um, and so, for example, last year uh, we ran an AIS shipping project and we have people who are uh, you know experts in shipping. And, and that project uh, proved really viable for, for understanding the impact of Brexit uh, on shipping lanes in, in the English Channel. So example previous years, uh, I think without going into the details here, you know, you can see just just from looking at these headlines, uh, not the, not the prettiest slide, but, but everything there from from shipping data, uh, you know, GPS data has been a big focus for us. Um, and, and I think uh, we, we were always sort of on the fringes in the early days of, of the types of data we were using because GPS probably wasn't commonly used in the commercial space or, or sort of consumer space. Um, but, you know, looking at uh, the, the presentations today, I can see that uh, there's now more GPS uh, data sets coming through. Uh, I think at the time uh, when I did my thesis, uh, we sort of said there's a GPS data set. Uh, there's, I think, in the re in the in the probably the region of of, of the other data sets we've talked about today, but quite daunting uh, to look at uh, as a student. Um, you know, that that billion data points uh, number certainly does scare you when you've been using the, the nice, tidy, clean data sets. Um, but we do. Uh, that, that's why we're we're here to support, and we're really keen to to help our students get through that. Because the likelihood is, um, some of us have probably been through it before. So, in terms of my journey, um, my project was uh, a sort of blank slate almost. Um, but the idea uh, was to to try and um, work towards proximity based passenger sensing, and what that meant was um, TfL at the time had a, a great understanding of. Um, who was uh, joining uh, the underground because you tap in and tap out via the Oyster card system. But if you uh, boarded a bus, there was no real way of understanding where people uh, alighted. Um, you just leave the bus whenever you like. And so we used the TFL bus API and a GPS data set uh, in conjunction and said that if you were within uh, close proximity of a bus stop, you would have a level of certainty that a person would 
near that bus stop, but actually that wasn't sufficient to prove they were on a bus. But but as we went further along each route, um, if you were within the, the sort of temporal bounds and spatial bounds of, of the bus um, and continuing on the route at the same time, we would uh, get increasing certainty as you moved along that route that you were actually on, on board the bus. Um, so once we managed to prove that, that that was a sort of valid methodology, we then started to look at actually um, if I'm a transport operator or a, a sort of city planner, what, what's really important to me? Well, it's understanding that the first mile and the last mile. So not only now uh, with the GPS data could we understand where people were alighting, but also what they were doing in the last mile. So where they were going to spend, uh, what they were doing, whether that be work activities, um, leisure activities, but also the first mile. The first mile is often overlooked, but um, you know really important uh, as a sort of a study area you know are people uh, you know disadvantaged because they're not within uh, close proximity to these bus stops and um, so the value added was was methodology for processing this raw gps data set and, and inferring public transport and last mile activity um i would say that, that the value um overall from a personal level uh, is is working with movement strategies um i don't know i'm sure i haven't been here four years that movement strategies are pretty happy to 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 take on colleagues as well um, as part of the scheme. And that's definitely uh, sort of value added from, from the corporate perspective. So my journey, um, again, just the, the diversity of, of, of uh, experiences I've had along the way. Um, after joining uh, or, or sort of before even finishing my dissertation, I was working two days a week with movement strategies, certainly uh, very rare among, amongst my peers at the time who were sort of in a, in a graduate world wondering uh, whether the grad scheme that they picked was right for them. I feel, uh, you know, incredibly lucky to have missed the grad scheme uh, and definitely accelerated my career. And that, that's 100 percent on the back of the CDRC uh, and movement strategies offering. And um, so after after joining as a consultant, I worked as an analyst uh, with our with our uh, Telefonica O2 team on TFL Edmund. And um, so estimating demand matrices for the whole of uh, the, the Transport for London's network, whether that be HGV vehicles, uh, the tube network, taxis, and and all other types of vehicles. I think 20, 20 was the number at the time. Um, as Jonathan said, I, I'm a CDRC mentor, and uh, you know attend these conferences uh, when invited to to really become an advocate for the scheme. I can't really give it enough praise, to be honest. Um, but been really lucky to work with some uh, very very talented people uh, as a mentor. In fact, Cristobal, who I'm going to hand over to in a second. Um, I sort of tried to mentor, but actually his skills are uh, way beyond the level that mine will ever be. So uh, really exciting as a kind of uh, advocate for the data science industry to see how uh, quickly uh, things have progressed in sort of two years since uh, you know, I finished mine, two or three years. And so in most of the time, um, I'm actually not in the data science industry as such, but um, within the sort of people movement world. So still using lots of data uh, and as, as i've said really lucky to be on uh, the client uh, on some interesting projects with some really big clients so the likes of manchester united internationally known but also major events like the world cup commonwealth games um and huge transport infrastructure uh, like manchester and stansted airport as well and um, so so drawing my uh, input to a close I'll, I'll hand over to cristobal um just again Thanks, thanks to everyone at the CDRC and, and Liverpool. Um, I certainly don't need to, to name drop people, but they know who they are. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, well, hello everyone. And thank you, Christian, for the nice introduction. Actually, I didn't know anything of SQL uh, before doing the, the project and Christian was the one who taught me that. So I'm very uh, thankful for that. Uh, well, and my experience about the CDRC project, basically I found out of the scheme when I was one of my classes, one of the teachers uh, encouraged us to look into this for looking for an internship. So I just applied online, wrote a cover letter and uh, sent my application to Movement Strategies. And actually it was Christian that was on the, that was the one who interviewed me and I guess uh, he liked the interview and then I started the project. And the project was initially on understanding the impacts of network disruption on mode, route, and travel time during the um, using GPS data. Uh, but at the end, the scope of the project became narrower over time, especially because I needed to understand how to work with a special temporal data, and I didn't have much of the skills for that. I was doing a master in data science, but it was not like geographic data science, so that took me some time. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Christian. So 
Um, at the end, instead of focusing on the effect of disruptions on individual behavior, I focus on the effect of disruptions on the transport network itself. And for that, because I didn't have like a nice data set about when disruptions occur, uh, what was the scale of those disruptions, I I just used a black cap protest in Elephant and Castle in London as an experiment. So I took like two weeks of data, which was still a lot, a lot of data or GPS data and compared the days with and without disruptions. And for that, my project was based basically on that paper, the spatial generalization and aggregation of maze equipment uh, data of data, which is basically you have the GPS traces, you create individual journeys from that, from those journeys, you take some characteristic points, you cluster those points, take the center of, uh, of those clusters, use that as uh, like a seed for creating Boronoi cells. From that, you uh, divide the territory into these Boronoi cells and you use that to aggregate the movement data between those cells. So the final product was to create, what I did was create a, a web app uh, done with Chinese to explore the data, which is the, the that image you can see there. So with that, you could see the difference in, differences in traffic flow and average speed for each link between the days with and without disruption. Um, next slide, please, Christian. So the value added to the business uh, from this process was, um, well, basically, I, a lot of the the skills that I got through the project uh, became useful for different uh, aspects of the business nowadays. So as you will see more like in my career path, uh, it's now divided between like two branches, uh, more like front end development and also uh, data analysis. Uh, so I learned skills for creating uh, web apps uh, and I have done some shiny apps for some other data products of the company. But on the data analysis side, I'm still working with GPS data and now kind of develop a better workflow than the one I did for my thesis. So now we have um, from the GPS data, we kind of get the journeys from one side. We have also the stops on the other side. And then we have also like these kind of flow maps. You can click, I think that's a video question. You can click on play and it, that's the outcome of the flow map. So you can basically see the, the traffic flow for the different links, uh, depending on the mode of transport, for, for example, at city or a specific part of the transport network. Um, so the use cases of how to use GPS data, we're still working on that. That is, of course, an ongoing uh, project, but very interesting indeed. And then my experience, the career after CDRC, basically after my internship, I started working in a, with the movement strategies. And as I said before, I just became like divided between two branches that I do at the same time. So one is the front end development that I started doing with Chinese, but now I'm working in a project with the O2, which involves working with React, which is uh, another framework for doing that. And on the other side, in the data analysis side, nowadays, uh, besides keeping working on the GPS data, I'm also now working with the mobile phone data from the O2 network to uh, try to understand now real-time traffic analysis uh, for the main roads in the UK. So that has been my path after CDRC, which has been, of course, uh, kind of my changing in terms of coming from sociology and now getting more into the data science part. Uh, so these are two of our uh, projects this year. Uh, I think one of them is still available. Uh, so we're using computer vision algorithms to automatically detect uh, people with restricted mobility. Um, and then the, the final one is inferring mode of transport from GPS data. So you can see that even from my uh, project in 2017 and Cristobal's uh, last year, we're still trying to find uh, you know, interesting use cases uh, using our, our GPS data sources. In the interest of time, I won't go into those. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, both of you. I mean, they're, they're both you know, really great use cases that you've described. And I think, uh, you know, we're talking about this ladder of engagement. I think movement strategies is very much at the top of that ladder in terms of uh, you know, closing the loop on, uh, on 
you know, moving to commissioning new projects and so on. And having you know three or more students in the business and five out of six years getting prizes, I think it's a great uh, reputational credit for the for the for the business as well. And I'm conscious of the time. I do did have one question I wanted to ask Christian in particular. I was just curious what it felt like being on the other side of the fence, I suppose, moving to a kind of discussion, negotiation, a commissioning role for projects. Uh, and particularly now part of GHD, you know, what that meant you had to do in terms of internal marketing within the organization to convince them of the merits of, uh, of, of continuing with this kind of association? Uh, well, in some ways it speaks for itself. Um, it doesn't take much convincing. Uh, we probably start with probably 10, 10 ideas every year and, and refine it down. Um, but, but honestly, these are real world business problems that we're trying to face. They might be client driven. Um, certainly the, the AI, AIS project last year was uh, driven by GHD's need to understand the, the impact of Brexit Brexit on the European shipping lane. So real world problems that are live and happening right now um, that our students, sometimes brighter minds with more time than we have to, to answer questions that we really need to answer ourselves. Um, but yeah, on the other side of the fence, it, it it's great. Um, it's scary, as I say, uh, you know, Christopher last year, uh, I'm interviewing him and he's, and he's already uh, heads above me at the interview phase. So by the time we actually got to some coding He's teaching me a lot rather than rather than the other way around but um yeah nice to be on that that side of the fence now yeah, yeah. well i think i talk about leadership isn't it that that, that you know, it goes goes with the territory of being a being a leader is uh, is actually bringing on new talent and, and and so on so i think again closing the loop in that sense as well is is, is really uh, interesting i like i love that phrase brighter minds with more time than we have that's it's a great one um th thank you very much indeed both of you and that brings to a close our uh our second session we've overrun slightly uh we'll get things back on track with a restart at two o'clock we have two further alumni presentations and then a, a panel discussion with uh, uh, three great panelists uh, to, to conclude the uh the overall event if in the meantime you have some time and uh you know you're having a bit of a late lunch or you want to have some lunch while you're doing it we, we have set up a zoom link for those that would like to social network we're conscious that this platform doesn't allow as, as much interaction as you might have on Zoom with kind of private chats and so on. Uh, but do feel free to uh, uh, find the Zoom link in your, your original email, click on that, and there's a chance just to say hello to one or two people that you might know. And we'll keep that open for the next half an hour or so. But we'll be due back uh, for the, the final uh, slot of the event um, at, uh, at two o'clock. So we'll uh, see you then. Thank you. <laughs>